Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to episode 49 of Lab Padres SpaceX and Starbase Weekly Updates. I'm Lewis, your host. Now let's dig in. Friday evening, crews continued with the scrapping of Ship 22 as a telehandler was seen scrapping tips of tiles off of one of the barrel sections. On Saturday, the tipless test nose cone was lifted out of low bay as SpaceX prepares it for testing in the nose cone jail in the near future. Later that morning, one of the large diameter deluge pipes and some of the high pressure canisters that were rescued from LC-39A were delivered to the launch site. That afternoon, SpaceX's LR-11000 crawler crane had its boom raised back into the air following a week of laying down, likely for routine maintenance. Back at the launch site, Ship 30's nose cone was lifted into low bay now that the test nose cone was out of the way. Late Sunday morning, the four tanks that are suspected to essentially serve as a water hammer arrester for the future deluge system were delivered to the launch site. That evening, the Booster Raptor installation platform left the launch site and was driven down Highway 4 to the build site, possibly for some repairs or maintenance. During a testing closure on Monday, Apollo, one of SpaceX's Boston Dynamics built robotic dogs, was spotted approaching the base of Test Stand B and wandering around. Tuesday, new piping was added in front of the orbital tank farm. It is not yet clear exactly what purpose this piping will eventually serve. By Wednesday, the suspected water hammer arresters and the associated pipework had been put into place and is being prepared for assembly. On Thursday, shortly after midnight, the orbital launch and integration tower chopsticks were raised to the launch position for Booster 7's static fire. Taking one last look at the launch table, we can see that the operations team decided to proceed without one of Booster 7's hydraulic power units. As the propellant tank farm booted up, the orbital launch mount's fire suppression system was tested in a quick readiness check. The booster's grid fins were also tested as part of the operations team's pre-status fire systems checks. Weeks of preparation culminated in about six seconds of a static fire test of Booster 7's engines. Operating at about half thrust, Booster 7's engines produced a whopping 7.9 million pounds or roughly 3,600 metric tons of thrust. Prior to engine ignition, the launch team decided not to fire one of the Raptors while a second aborted at startup, making this a 31 engine static fire test. Otherwise, the static fire test was a complete success. Switching over to Florida on Sunday, Tug Crosby Endeavor towed a short follow Gravitas into Port Canaveral with booster B-1069 following the Starlink Group 5-3 launch. That afternoon, in spite of one of the Octagrabber's arms failing to retract, B-1069 was lifted from the deck of the drone ship and transferred to shore for processing. That evening, night turned to day as Falcon 9 booster B-1073 took to the Florida skies for the launch of the Amazonius Nexus launch from Complex 40. On Wednesday morning, SpaceX fairing recovery vessel Doug towed a short fall of Gravitas out to sea in support of the Starlink 5-4 launch. A short time later, booster B-1069 was lifted and rotated horizontal before being lowered to the waiting transporter for its trip back to Hangar X. Bob returned to port on Thursday with four recovered fairing halves. This is the most we've seen brought back to the port in one trip. This week, our eyes in the sky, the great Greg Scott took to the Florida skies again to bring us amazing shots of the Cape. At historical launch complex 39A, things are actually looking a little less crowded for a change following the recent transfer of equipment to Starbase. Three large horizontal cryogenic storage tanks, as well as the water deluge equipment previously designated for the now defunctional Origin Starship launch infrastructure was removed from the site shortly after the previous flyover. And since the last flyover, the chopsticks have been added to the Starship launch tower and are anxiously awaiting the installation of the traveling block and then the reeving of the lifting cable. And finally for this site, the new vertical tank between the two launch towers now appears to be structurally complete. The mystery of its purpose, however, continues. 
Is it a water tank, a LOX tank, or something else? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Several miles down the coast, SpaceX's other Cape Launch facility, Space Launch Complex 40, is seeing new activity between Falcon 9 launches as they took to build the infrastructure to support future cargo and Crew Dragon launches from this location. At NASA's Launch Complex 39B, work is underway to prepare the site for the next Artemis mission, which is currently expected in 2024. Inland, at NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building, preparations are also underway for Artemis II. Just north of the massive building, the mobile launch platform is undergoing repairs and refurbishment following the Artemis I launch late last year. After examining the platform following the first SLS launch, it will be interesting to see what steps NASA takes to try to reduce the damage inflicted by the next launch. Behind the mobile launch platform, we can see a second work area that will likely be used to build the second mobile launch platform that will be needed to support the first SLS Block 1B launch scheduled for the Artemis 4 mission. Next, let's move to the southwest and check in on SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. From the outside, the Hangar X facility appears relatively calm, but inside is likely a hive of activity. With SpaceX's stated goal of launching 100 rockets this year, the Falcon 9 refurbishment facility will be busier than ever. At the southern end of the building, we can see a very long SPMT, which SpaceX uses to move around the horizontal Falcon 9 boosters along with various other Falcon 9 hardware. Across the retention pond from Hangar X is the developing Starship production facility for Cape Canaveral. Checking in first on the tower prefabrication area, it seems that progress on the third Starship launch tower has slowed. There are currently seven modules of the next tower built, which is the same as the last flyover. A possible cause of the slowdown can be seen here though, as the crane which had been building these section is being disassembled off to the side. On the ground, however, we can see that columns for at least two more sections are waiting, one of which appears to be the top section. This could indicate that the third tower will be shorter. It is interesting to note that so far no piping or conduit has been installed on these tower modules. Just to the west of the fabrication area, SpaceX has wasted no time in starting on the chopsticks for the third tower. Just weeks after the last chopsticks were rolled out and installed on the tower 39A, crews have already begun welding together the first pieces of the new chopsticks and also started assembly of its carriage. The main structure of the 39A QD arm is still in this area, but likely will be moved to the launch site in the near future for installation. Structurally, the Florida Star Factory is near complete. The entire lower portion of the building appears finished, including the overhead doors along the western wall. The higher portion of the southern end is just waiting for the steel to be installed in the final corner while the roofers are close behind. In the final corner of this site, there is once again no progress to report on the first of the Florida Mega Bays. We have still heard nothing about why construction of this building has stopped without a single piece of steel being installed. Just south of the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex are Blue Origin's Cape Canaveral Production Facilities. The north campus of this facility is an active and operational production and testing facility. On the west side of this area is the tank cleaning and testing building which serves the tanks of the New Glenn's first stage. Greg was lucky enough to catch the door open as he flew over giving us a rare glimpse at what appears to be the test stand inside the door. Much of the facility's southern campus is currently an active construction site. The structure of the new vertical assembly building appears to be complete with wall columns and roof trusses installed. It currently appears to have two doors, one in the front and one in the back. Also of note is the 30-ton bridge crane that has been installed at the top of the building. Just to the south, steel is going up quickly on the new Reef Pathfinder building which appears to be nearing the halfway point for the assembly of the facility. About eight and a half miles to the southeast is the Blue Origin Launch Complex 36, where they hope to launch the new Glen as soon as late this year. This is also home to a water tower that supplies the pad's water deluge system. At 350 feet tall, this water tower is not just the tallest at the Cape, but quite possibly the tallest in the world. 
Although the build and launch sites are less than 9 miles apart, the new Glenn rockets will actually have a much longer trip to the pad as they have to go north by the VAB and LC-39A, then down the coast to LC-36. Taking a quick tour through the rest of the active launch facilities, ULA's SLC-41 is currently empty, awaiting the first launch of the Vulcan Centaur. Just to the south of the pad is ULA's Vertical Integration Facility, where they have just finished the stacking of the first Vulcan as part of the pre-launch preps. Down the coast at ULA's other launch site, SLC-37, preparations are underway for the second to last ever Delta IV heavy launch. The three orange boosters can be seen in the open door as teams work towards the launch which could come as soon as next month. At Relativity Space's Launch Complex 16, the company's first orbital class 3D printed rocket is back at the launch pad as they work towards its inaugural launch. At Space Launch Complex 46, a mobile gantry has been spotted on the pad. SLC-46, which is under lease by Astra, is likely being modified to support Rocket 4. Finally for this week, we will check in on SpaceX's marine assets that were spotted in Port Canaveral this week. Fairing recovery vessel Doug was docked between missions. Notably, its fast boat was not on board during the flyover. Autonomous drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas was docked nearby following its successful return from the Starlink Group 4-3 launch. The Octagrabber was still on deck awaiting its return to its hangar for its next mission. Some workers on the Octagrabber helped give a sense of scale for the size of the massive hold-down mechanism. Falcon 9 Booster B-1069 was still on the dock following its return from the Starlink 5-3 launch. On the ground behind it, you can spot two fairing halves as well as the horizontal transporter that will return the Falcon 9 to Hangar X for refurbishment. Dragon recovery vessel Megan was also tied to the dock in Port Canaveral. Under the helipad, you can see the not-for-flight Dragon capsule that crews use for training exercises. And there you have it. What an exciting week here at Starbase. We'll see you next week, and thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.